Thank you. So this is joint work with uh, Stephen Goldfeder at uh, Cornell Tech. So <clears throat> the motivation for this work is mostly from cryptocurrencies, but not exclusively. Um, as you, most of you are aware, um, spending bitcoins or any kind of cryptocurrencies is controlled by a digital signature and the security of your coins is really controlled by the security of the key that you use to sign and therefore the storage of your secret key is the single point of failure for your system. So how do you avoid single point of failures? Well, you take your key and you break it, you split it into multiple devices. And the standard way to do this um, is to use what we call threshold signatures, where we split this key among N servers in a way that at least T plus one of them are, can cooperate to produce a signature, but T or less cannot sign and actually shouldn't have any information about the key at all. So what are the advantages of splitting your keys? There are several advantages. And the, the one, the, 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 in the context of cryptocurrencies, the, the most important one is that a threshold signature, once it's been issued, looks exactly the same as a regular signature. There's a public key there's, that verifies it. And once the signature is produced, how it was produced behind the scenes is completely transparent. So this is in particular the main difference that you have between threshold signature and multi-signatures where this policy of T plus one servers needing to cooperate is implemented by replicating N keys and producing T plus one. You need to see T plus one signatures. And apart from the efficiency uh, concerns that that this the replication creates. There's also anonymity concerns related to how the signature travels through the network. So in this talk, we're going to focus on the digital signature algorithm, which for those of you who are not familiar, it works as I described in the, in the slide. There's a group, a cyclic group G of order Q, um, a generator G that generates G. This is a generic description about DSA works. Just plug in your favorite group. The way Bitcoins works is with a group of elliptic, uh, a group of points of an elliptic curve. But what I'm going to talk applies to any uh, implementation of the DSA algorithm. So your private key is a random element in ZQ. It's a random element between one and Q. Your public key is G to the X, which I think is missing from the slide. Uh, to sign a, a, a message M, you pick a random nonce, which is another integer between one and Q, and you raise G to the K, and that produced the first part of the signature, which is R. And then the second part, so R is a group element. The second part of the signature is a scalar, is an integer, which is computed as K inverse time M plus XR. So the secret key comes in the computation of S, and the nonce come in the computation of R and S. And one important thing that needs to be stressed is that the value k has to be kept secret. It's very important that it's secret because if you find out what k is, then you'll find out what x is from the second part of the signature. Okay? All you, all you can reveal is g to the k, but not k. Okay, so if you ask me 20 plus years ago that I was still working on this problem, I would have told you you were crazy. I worked on this problem when I was a graduate student. This was part of my doctoral thesis. A, at that time, the motivation was obviously not Bitcoin. It was uh, uh, certification authorities, uh, nuclear uh, weapons control. It was really fun. Uh, um, but and so I, you know, we wrote this paper. We published it 22 years ago. It was in my thesis. I thought I was done. Well. There is, in that paper, there's, there's, there's an issue. So if you share your key with the standard Shamir secret sharing that hopefully all of you are familiar with, your shares are a point on a polynomial of degree t. The free term is your secret key x. What happens is that the computation of DSA requires a multiplication 
which is the, the multiplication of k and x. k has to be secret. So k is also shared among the parties that are uh, computing the signature together. When you have two polynomials that you multiply them, you're going to end up with a polynomial of degree 2t. And the problem is that now to reconstruct the signature, you need to have 2t plus 1 points on this polynomial. So we're diverging from the definition that I gave you before, where if t is your parameter, t plus 1 people should be able to sign. And now we have double that number. So at that time, I didn't think it was an issue. Turns out that Bitcoin uh, companies were very concerned about the doubling of the servers. It means you need to really uh, put a lot more servers on, 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 on this network. Also, theoretically, can we match? Can we do this um, threshold optimality? And in particular, you cannot do two, two out of two, right? Because if your threshold is one, meaning one person shouldn't sign, but two people should sign, with my old paper, you would need three people to sign. So, um, so we would like to have this threshold optimality, or also called dishonest majority, in which even if you have T people which are trying to forge signature, T plus one people should be able to, to sign. Okay? So how do we do that? So for the two-party case, turns out that the problem with my original solution was already identified in the early 2000s. There's a paper by McKenzie and Ryder. And then more recently, this paper was improved by Yuda Lindell and uh, Demer and all in very recent papers. Um, again, there's been a renaissance of research in this topic because of uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, for the general case in which you have T servers and, and parties, um, I, Stephen and I and other co-authors have been working on this. And these two papers were really a generalization of the McKenzie writer approach from two parties to end parties. Um, and what, so let me tell you a little bit more. So, okay, so there is the secret key X, which is a random number between one and Q. How do we split it be between end parties? Well, if this is my key, I can generate a polynomial, a random polynomial degree T, put X in the free term, and give all of you a point on this polynomial. In this case, I'm acting as a dealer, as a trusted dealer, which is okay, because this is my key. But what if all of us in this room want to collectively generate this key X without any of us knowing the key X to begin with? Then in that case, you need to have a distributed key generation protocol. And we have had lots of work done on this in the past as well. And there were several protocols, which again, didn't work for the particular case of DSA with, honest, uh, with dishonest majority. So in this previous work that appeared in the last couple of years, what we, we changed the way we did this distributed key generation phase. Instead of thinking of X as distributed via the Shamir secret sharing, we distributed X by encrypting it under a additively homomorphic encryption scheme, such as Payet, and then distributing the decryption key, OK? So now, the reason you have a share of this key is that you have a share of the decryption key that allows you to decrypt X. Now, you will never decrypt X. What you're going to do, we're going to use this encryption of X in sort of an, using the homomorphic property of the encryption scheme and to end up with an encryption of the signature, with an encryption of S. And surprisingly, the fact that it, the, the, the encryption is additively homomorphic, it's OK. We don't need, by adding communication rounds, we don't need fully homomorphic encryption. So we're OK. So that basically summarizes in, in, in a slide the previous work that we did. The problem was that the one additively homomorphic encryption scheme that we know is Payet's encryption scheme, where this distributed key generation, where we all together come up with the RSA modelers and the generator of the Payet group and so on. There's a paper. You can read it. It works. There's a protocol. Try to implement it in practice. 
not so much. So what we wanted to do was a threshold DSA in which the trusted setup was practical. So we didn't want to use this distributed Paillet um, uh, key generation scheme. So let me take a step back and show you the crucial tool that we use in this, uh, in this paper, which then I, I realized goes back to a very old paper by Neve Gilboa on generating um, distributed generated and other say keys, by the way. So let's assume that Alice and Bob have two values, A and B, which are multiplicative shares of a secret S. What does that mean? That if you take A and B and you multiply them together, you get S. My goal was to go from this representation of the secret S to an additive representation of the secret S. So what I want to end up is with two number X and Y such that X plus Y is equal to S. And Alice knows X and Bob knows Y. So Alice is going to encrypt her share, her multiplicative share, under this Paillet encryption scheme, this additive homomorphic encryption scheme, and sends it to Bob. Bob picks a random number M and sends back to Alice an encryption of A, B plus M. This is something that Bob can do because uh, e is an additively homomorphic encryption scheme, so he can multiply by a, constant, by a scalar, which is B, and he can add a scalar, which is M. So Bob sends this back. Bob's share is going to be minus M. Alice's share is going to be whatever she decrypts from Bob. Now, A prime and B prime together is going to be S. Right? Okay, so remember that if these are shares of the DSA uh, signature key, this numbers work modulo Q. The encryption of the Paillet scheme is an RSA modulus N. So there is a mismatch between the modulus over which we're doing the homomorphic addition over Paillet and the modulus over which the shares have to operate. So what we're going to use, we're going to use a very large M, which will make sure that there is no wrap around and everything works over the integers. In particular, if we choose, since our numbers are between 0 and, uh, and Q, it's enough to choose our N uh, bigger than, than Q cube to guarantee <coughs> that no wraparound is going to happen and everything happens over the integer. <coughs> but this is only true if the parties act honestly. If I have a number which between 1 and Q and I encrypt that number and Bob responds the same way, then everything is under Q square, so we're fine. The problem is that either Alice or Bob can input into this protocol a number which is larger than their share. And that will cause the protocol to fail. Now, normally, this wouldn't be a big issue because most likely, most likely, what's going to happen is that the signature is going to fail. At the end, after we get the signature, we, we check the signature fail. We say, oh, well, somebody's not honest here. Let's scrap everything and start from scratch. But the problem is that the failure of the signature may be related, and we don't have a way to prove it or disprove it, to the actual inputs of the honest players. So by injecting a failure into the system, the adversary may learn some information, very limited amount of information, about the secret key, the secret shares of the honest players. So we had two options here to fix this. The first one is somewhat expensive and was to add a range proof to the ciphertext that gets sent into this protocol. Meaning, I'm going to prove to you that what I'm inputting to this protocol is small. So I'm going to do a zero knowledge proof that this thing is small. And now we're back to numbers being small, no wraparounds. The faster solution, um, we're not going to use the proof. And then we're going to wrap, you know, cross our fingers and hope that whatever information is leaked to the adversary will not help into forging the essence. And this is, I believe, is a reasonable assumption because at the end, what you're getting is one bit of information about this, about this key. Because if something happens, you stop, you erase everything, start from scratch with a new key. 
So, but it is an assumption. It's not standard. It's ad hoc, and we're sort of hedging our bets here. We're saying you you can do this or you can do that. Okay. So now I showed you how you can do two people going from multiplicative to additive. Well, now you can do this with many people. If we have A and B shared additively, and we want to compute a sharing of the product AB, what happens is that A times B is all the cross products, right? So what happens, every pair of players is going to invoke this protocol that I just told you on each pair AIBJ. So it, every pair AIBJ will be mapped into an additive share, when then when you put together all the additive shares that you receive from this n square um, pairwise protocol, you'll end up with a additive share of the product AB. Okay? Sorry. This value in the blue box is the share that each player will hold. And if you sum all those shares, those will be the product A. Okay? Now, what does it have to do with DSI? Let me show you. So the key generation, now we're going back to the Shamir secret sharing key generation. Every player generates a random value, shares it among everybody else in this room. We all add the shares that everybody sent us and now we have shares of a random value x that nobody knows what it is because we each have contributed a random component to it. Then uh, we all compute g to the x by doing what's called interpolation in the exponent meaning we all reveal g to the xi and then you can apply a linear combination to this value to get g to the x. How do you compute g to the k? It's exactly the same way. Um, the problem is that then we're going to need k minus 1. So you compute g to the k by the same way in which you compute g to the x. Everybody generates, contributes a random value. We all put them together. We have g to the k. The problem is how do we end up with shares of k minus 1, which we're going to need in the computation of, of x? We use what's called beaver strict, which is we also generate another random number, gamma. And then we use this multiplication protocol to get additive shares of k gamma. We reconstruct k gamma in the clear. We invert it in the clear. And if we multiply the inverse, time our shares of k, we end up with shares times our shares of gamma. I think. We end up uh, there might be a type of that. We end up with shares of k minus one, right? So now we have shares of k minus one, and we have shares of x. Now we need to compute S. We do the same thing again. There's a product there between K minus 1 and X. We invoke the multiplication protocol. We end up with additive shares of the product. M and R are constant. You just put them into the computation as well. Well, what do you do? Reveal SI and, and compute S, interpolate S. Well, it's actually a little complicated than that. Again, some dishonest players may contribute bad values may inject faults and once again we're not able to prove that injecting faults will not reveal information about the honest players values say that one of the bad guys messed up one of the multiplication protocols before and that is going to eventually result in the signature not verifying but this signature not verifying may give you information about the value the input of the good guys so you can't just reveal a side and recompute the signature. What you need to do is something a little more complicated, which I don't have time to get into. But basically, you do a, a mini multi-party computation in which the parties check together, do we have shares of a valid signature or not? And if they don't, they abort. If they do, they reveal. So now, signatures are revealed only if they're valid. We did an implementation. It's uh, the it's. Those are the timing. You can look at the paper for the details. We have dramatic improvements over the, our previous work in terms of particularly of the key generation, but also over the, uh, key gener the signature generation as well. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, we, we have an extension which uses this multiplication to additive <laughs> protocol. Instead of using additive homomorphic encryption, we use oblivious transfer. Um, 
the advantage of that is that you can do oblivious transfer based on DBH, and therefore you're not going out of the Daskin log like assumptions that you use for DSA. You're not using extra assumptions. The bad side of that is that OT will consume more bandwidth than the approach based on uh, added to the other more Concurrent work. Come on Thursday, uh, Yuda and uh, Ayo uh, will present a paper which is exactly the same result, different techniques. We found out what the papers were submitted, which is very exciting. We, uh, but you know, both papers got in, which is great. The techniques are very different. One important difference between the two papers, our definition of security is game-based. Basically, what I, I can guarantee you at the end is that the adversary will not be able to forge DSA signature. Their, their definition of security is stronger. Uh, they can guarantee that the adversary learns no knowledge at all at the end of the protocol. The disadvantage of that is that they can do the little game that we did about making an extra conjecture, and they have to use the reverse range proofs. Uh, there's another very recent paper that just got accepted at the IEEE SMP. They use OT for this idea of multiplication to addition, but somehow they end up with a logged round protocols while our protocol and UDAS protocol is custom. And that's basically that. And I don't know, I have that two slides. I think it's the job of the All right, well, let's take the speaker right now.